honey, you mean Huncules. Ooh, I'd like to make some sweet music Our with story actually begins long before Hercules, many eons ago. Hi again, everyone. Welcome to episode six. So last week, we kind of left a little bit on a cliffhanger with maybe a few spoiler alerts. And this week will sort of be a gap in the story of the creation of the universe and all the gods within it. Like his father before him, Zeus was able to overthrow his father, Cronus, the titan god of time, who consumed all of Zeus's siblings as soon as they were born. The only reason Zeus was even around to go through the whole dethroning thing was because his mother Rhea acting on advice of her parents, Gaia and the mutilated Uranus, switched out little baby Zeus with the rock swaddled in a blanket. Cronus ate the rock baby whole, thinking he had successfully eaten all of his children and locked in his powers for good, so there was nothing else for him to worry about anymore. But the baby that was swapped out was raised in secrecy until he reached manhood, which is somewhere between like 16 and 18, right? I would assume, probably. But once he was a man, a noble, hardworking man, and a great brother and a good son, at least to one of his parents, he disguised himself as a cupbearer for his father, who was totally unaware of his existence, and drank a cup that his vengeful son handed him that was full of mustard and wine which is both gross and kind of funny. And after drinking the gross mustard wine, Cronus puked up all five of his fully grown adult children and one rock baby, which all probably hurt a little bit coming back up. But once they were thrown up and hopefully a little bit cleaned up, Zeus was reunited with his older siblings, Hestia, Demeter, Hades, and Poseidon. And from here, I mean, unlike Cronus and the other Titan children, all of these siblings actually banded together to ensure that their terrible cannibalistic father wasn't going to get back into the driver's seat of the universe anytime soon. But that whole situation kind of unfolds later. But so anyways, for like the last four episodes, we went back all the way to the very beginning of time when there was literally nothing or chaos. And now look at us. We have a great portion of the soon-to-be Olympians born... So, good progress so far. Hey, look at us. Look at us. Huh? Who would have thought? Not me. But all of these legends that act as the foundation of the creation of the universe in Greek mythology are all kind of tied up with a neat little bow by this one guy, good old Hesiod. I have mentioned it before too, but he was not the only guy who had poems and plays that discussed the Greek theogeny story. There are lots of other sources out there that mention it as well with their own subtle or not so subtle creative differences, but Hesiod's poem, Theogony, is kind of considered to be like the most complete and encompassing version of events, and also one of the older ones, so it's usually marked out to be the standard and quote-unquote official storyline. So Hesiod was a Greek didactic poet, meaning that what he wrote was intended to teach something, like morals, in an entertaining way. He was actually one of the oldest Greek poets and is referred to as some by the father of didactic poetry. And how cool is this? The name Hesiod in Greek translates out to something along the lines of he who emits the voice. Now, this may be a chicken and the egg situation as well, or it could be just a name he gave himself, kind of like Alicia Keys. He's often compared to, or at least put next to, the other super famous, well-known Greek poet, Homer, who was the one who got the writing style named after him, and is like pretty well-known like worldwide. But the two authors were both out and composing around the same time, somewhere between 750 BC and 650 BC. And like all great historical writers, there is some question about whether or not he even was a real person at all. The same is said about Homer, Geoffrey Chaucer, and even William Shakespeare. But 
I mean, ancient Greece was so long ago, so maybe he was and maybe he wasn't. But we'll probably never know the truth, maybe unless time travel is ever made possible. But even if he isn't real, somebody wrote these poems, right? So anyways, let's stay on the path that suggests that he was a real guy living in ancient Greece, eating figs, herding lambs, and dreaming up stanzas. So Hesiod grew up in Boeotia, a central region of Greece, and also the home of the two mountain brothers, Chiathrion and Helicon, in a place called Ascra, or as he referred to it in Works and Days, a cursed place, cruel in the winter, hard in the summer, never pleasant. As a boy, Hesiod worked as a shepherd at the foot of the mountain Helicon, on a small farm with his family. While tending to the sheep of their flock, Hesiod was granted the gift of inspiration by the nine muses, the goddesses of arts and science, who were actually known to live on the same mountain as Hesiod and his family. Things went downhill for Hesiod after his father passed away, though, and there was a conflict between him and his brother Perses in regards to the ownership of their father's land. I don't know why, considering how advanced the Greeks were and how much we have taken from them and incorporated into our modern democracy, but just the idea of an ancient lawsuit just seems hilarious. But apparently, after going through these not-so-pleasant proceedings, he ended up getting kind of boned by his brother, who pretty much scooped up all of the ownership, which left Hesiod pretty much homeless. So after being betrayed by his blood, he took off and headed west to the town of Naphikos in the Gulf of Corneth. And also, here's another hot take. Some people actually think that his brother may have been just a character thought up to be used as some sort of literary device. The name Perses means the destroyer. And in his description of his brother in his own writings, he goes on to say that he ended up becoming penniless and had to go beg for money from Hesiod. Which, I mean, to be fair, does kind of seem like something someone would write to make themselves sound cooler, but like, I don't know. If the brother is real, then you might think that life sounded a little rough for the poet, but based off how he describes his family farm in his works and days, it seems like his family is probably a little bit better off than most. A lot of people think that just because he was able to write, maybe, that he's obviously of a higher station in life, but these ancient civilizations, like Greece, most citizens were pretty literate. So that wasn't necessarily a symbol of wealth. But he does go on to mention that his father employed one of his friends on their farm, and they had servants for in and outside of the house. The other thing to note is that Hesiod's father was apparently originally from Syme in Aeolus, which is modern-day Turkey. So from the trip it took him to get from Syme to Askra, he would have had to travel a great distance by both sea and land. And it is thought that his father was able to pass on his knowledge of the world beyond to his son, which he was then able to use in his work. But after all the writing he did, at some point in the hundred years we think he was around for, he died. And just like we don't know if he even was a real person, we also don't really know where he's buried. There's apparently two different accounts of both how he died and where his grave is. One states that an oracle actually told him that he was going to die if he went to Nemea. So like everyone else who gets a prophecy from an oracle, he thought he could just beat it. So instead, he went to another town where he was then sacrificed in a temple. Poets who wrote epics had the opportunity to drizzle in a couple of little details about themselves. Hesiod takes it a step further and actually puts himself in the story as it unfolds, slightly, like, just a little bit kind of breaking the fourth wall. So let's get back to the theogony. We've been talking about it for about four weeks in sort of a broken up manner, but this time we'll start with the very beginning. 
All right, so line one of 1021. Hesiod opens up the Algini with a hymn to the muses. This was kind of a normal practice for a lot of ancient Greek literature. I think sort of a way to thank the gods for the creativity. So it kicks off with Hesiod, who himself is a major part of this, invoking the nine muses, the daughters of Zeus, Calliope, the muse of epic poetry, Cleo, the muse of history, Erto, the muse of lyric poetry and love poetry, Eurtope, the muse of music, Melpomene, the muse of tragedy, Polyhymnia, the muse of sacred poetry, Terpsichore, the muse of dance, Thalia, the muse of comedy, and Urania, the muse of astronomy. And he goes on to say that they are going to help him continue to tell the story of creation of the universe and thanks them for gifting him with the beautiful poetry that is coming up. From here on, the long poem is broken up into another 14 sections. Cosmology, the castration of Uranus, spirits of night, sea gods, bestiary, the titans, him to Hecate, children of Cronus, Prometheus, Titanomachy, cosmography, typhus, Olympian gods, goddesses, and men. After he goes over how the story came into his possession, this is where all of the gods begin to get born. So the same way we did, he starts everything off with the empty void of nothingness, chaos. And then, well, the rest of the primordial gods show up, right? Gaia, Eros, Tartarus, and all the rest of them, which are used to lay out the basic natural forces of the universe. That's all covered in, well, we'll call them chapters here to make things easier, but they're kind of like little poems that all got mashed together into one larger poem, which is Theogeny. But anyways, we'll call this birth of the first gods is laid out in cosmology. Then it skips forward to the castration of Uranus, a little self-explanatory. This covers the story of what went down between Uranus, his mother-slash-lover Gaia, his youngest son Cronus, and the famous Sickle. Then, jumping around a little bit, we move on to a very short section, consisting of only 15 lines the children of the night are all introduced. And not even by name, but only by what they are the personification of, like forgetfulness and famine and tearful sorrows, fightings, and so on like that. It is actually like super short. Not much attention, if any, is given to the children of Nyx and Erebus, like at all. Then Hesiod goes on to lay out the other sea deities. These are all of the children of Pontus and his mother Gaia. These guys, again, kind of get the shaft in Theogeny because there's only 32 lines devoted to introducing them. So now, even though the previous section surrounds the sea deities, it actually doesn't include all of them. After the more normal gods of the sea, he goes over the monstrous offsprings of their union. This part This part of the list includes the likes of the Great E and the Gorgons, as well as Typhoon, Cerberus, and all the rest. Next up is the Titans. This is where things seem to get a little out of place, so that's why we went over the introductions in a little bit of a different way versus the way that it is actually laid out in Hesiod's version. Sorry, Hes. So I think it's off just because the castration of Uranus is like, way earlier on than this, but who cares, whatever. It all technically does make sense still, so don't worry. But so here is where we meet Titans and also all of their children, a great deal of which are rivers. And this knowledge of all of these various landmarks all over the ancient Greek world is something that his well-traveled seafaring father was probably able to teach him about. And if you thought, 18 kids was bad. How about 3,000 sons, 3,000 neatly angled daughters, and then like another 10 daughters? And like also, even though 6,010 kids seems like way too many kids, but it actually could have been even more. The number 3,000 was meant to be something that was incalculable. 
So the 3,000 sons are the river gods or the Potomoi, which translates out to literally mean rivers. And the 3,000 daughters are the Oceanids and include some big names like Taichi, Dion, and Calypso. Man, I love that name so much. It's so pretty. So many Greek deity names are just like amazingly beautiful. But anyways, Hesiod goes on to tell us that as mortal men, we would not even be able to contemplate all of the different deities and all of their godly names. But after all of these kids, in comes the rest of the Titans and the way smaller amount of offspring that they had. And also another comment on the shapeliness of the ankles of the goddess of victory, Nike. After these introductions, he takes a slight break and offers a hymn to Hecate for 43 lines of his poem. Here he explains how Zeus honors her above all of the other gods, and how even though she is an only child, that doesn't detract away from her ranking among the other gods, but it actually enhances it. So Hesiod lays out that she is the daughter of the Titans, Perseus, and Asteria. Now, I don't think we actually have formally introduced this goddess yet either, so let's jump right on into it. So Hecate is one of the really fun goddesses. She has rule over witchcraft, the moon, necromancy, and ghosts. Spooky fun, right? So her little backstory here is actually the first time she appears in any literature. Even though she's not an Olympian, she actually did have a pretty large Celt following of witches in Thessaly. And after that short break to honor the mysterious goddess, we hop right back onto the trail and get back to the children of Cronus. These are the guys we went over last week. The poor kids that had to both be eaten and thrown up by their own father. This is, of course, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, Zeus, and then the rock baby. So this section ends, of course, with the children being thrown up, Zeus taking control from his father, and then ultimately freeing the Cyclopses and Hecatonchires, something that his father refused to do. And the six of them then, of course, give Zeus his glowing lightning bolt and booming thunder. Two things that the Earth did not have before. Okay, so from this point on, this will pretty much be entirely new information to Oh My Gods. Kind of. I did kind of jump ahead a little bit, but overall, this is past our current point in the story. So this section is about Prometheus, who is the titan son of Iapetus and Clymene, actually one of four brothers, the others being Atlas, Menoteus, and scatterbrained Epimetheus. Poor guy. But Prometheus is considered to be a trickster who actually managed to pull the wool over the eyes of Zeus and steal fire from him, and he actually succeeded. So he pretty much thought that the gods were being a little selfish, so he decided to pull sort of a heist. Doing like kind of a misdirection, the titan originally tried to trick Zeus by offering him animal fat and bones and trying to pass it off as meat. But even though Zeus caught this trick, Prometheus was still able to steal fire on a hollow fennel stalk and give it to mankind. Obviously pissed, Zeus made something evil to punish mankind for accepting the gift of fire from Prometheus, and the beautiful evil thing that he made as punishment was womankind. This is where Pandora comes in. Zeus had her made by Hephaestus, the limping god, from the earth to be beautiful and charming so she could usher in misery to mankind. And then, also to punish Prometheus, the thief, um, Zeus chains him to a cliff and then has an eagle come and visit him to rip out and eat his liver every single day because it will continue to grow back. And also he's like immortal, so... Next up is the Titanomachy, which literally means Titan battle. So this was a 10-year war between the older gods, the Titans, like Cronus, and the younger gods, 
the likes of Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, their sisters, and the help of the Hecatonchires, the Cyclopses, and oddly enough, Themis and her son Prometheus. So from this decade-long war, the winner, of course, was the younger gods, who then went on to become the Olympians. At this point, they imprisoned some, not all, but a couple of the Titans, and for some delicious irony, the Hecatonchires then became the guards who watched over them in their cell in the depths of Tartarus. So after the Titans are locked up, this is where the big three divvy up the three main parts of the world, the sky, the sea, and the underworld, leaving the earth as some sort of no man's land that was kind of open to all. Then, as the brother of the second chapter, cosmology, there is cosmography. The difference being that cosmology deals with the origins of the universe and all the heavenly bodies, and cosmography is more about mapping out like the planets and the various elements in the universe, like the Earth. So in this section, this is where the layout of the Earth is described. The whole silver pillars of heaven and like where Tartarus is and like the dome of heaven, the river Oceanus and like all the rest of that fun stuff. And then he goes on to discuss Typhus. This is the youngest son of Gaia and Tartarus. So when the Titans were punished and expelled from the earth by Zeus, Typhus came in and started wreaking havoc all over the earth. His name means hurricane, and he is described as a god of storms. So sometimes he's personified as like a hurricane or a typhoon, but then also as a fire-breathing storm. So like maybe a volcano as well. And of course, after he started laying waste to the earth, he was eventually subdued by Zeus and then imprisoned in Tartarus with the rest of the Titans. Next up is the 55 lines that are used to get the rest of the Olympians established at the top. So Hera was not Zeus's first wife. She was actually his seventh. His first wife, Métis, who is the one who gives the great god the cup of wine and mustard, she actually becomes pregnant. But being the goddess of planning and cunning, when it was prophesied that the child would be extremely powerful, just like all of the patriarchs before him, he became worried that this child would also overthrow him, as it is a family tradition now, apparently. So in one version, Métis is also a shapeshifter, and Zeus ends up tricking her and actually gets her to shapeshift into a bunch of different creatures while still being pregnant to prove her powers to the god. She then eventually turns herself into a fly and then he swallows her whole. But Hesia just says that Zeus tricked her and somehow swallowed her whole. Eventually, Zeus then, of course, gives birth to Athena himself. And this pisses off his last wife Hera so much that she on her own gives birth to Hephaestus as revenge, who is then referred to as the lame god or the lame one. And that doesn't mean he's not like one of the cool gods. It's meant to describe him as being deformed in some way or like having a limp. But besides those two, the other Olympic children are born from Zeus and his other wives as well. This then brings in pretty much the rest of the Olympians and a whole bunch of other gods as well, with both his wives and a whole lot of affairs. And finally, the last section is where Hesiod goes on about mortal men and their relationship with the immortal, deathless goddesses. He opens up by describing demigods by saying that even if goddesses lay with mortal men, they will deliver childlike gods. Following that, a bunch of relationships between the goddesses and men are mentioned and their offspring are named. Interestingly, Thetis and the hero Peleus are mentioned and of course, after their union, the sea nymph brought the lion-hearted baby Achilles into being. And then he wraps it all up in a nice little bow by saying, but now sweet-voiced muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus, who hold the Aegeus, sing of the company of women. So this was like a super sped up summary of Hesiod's poem Theogony, 
we kind of went over it more in depth in some of the earlier episodes, but only up to like line 506. And I know that seems kind of weird, but the rest of the story laid out here will actually be retold more in depth in a couple episodes later on. So don't worry, we're not actually going to skip anything. If you want to read or listen to the full text, it is available like all over the place. I can throw a link to the full text translated by Gregory Nagy and Jay Banks from the Center for Hellenic Studies at Harvard, but remember, every translation comes with its own quirks, so no matter where you read it, there's going to be some differences. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so now moving on to winning the free Oh My Gods t-shirt. This is the question for the contest. Who told Hesiod the origins of the universe? So, if you know the answer, you can head on over to ohmygods.ca slash contest and submit your correct answer, then add in all of your contact info and your t-shirt size. And if you get picked, you can win a free Oh My Gods t-shirt. Very cool, right? So next week is going to be really fun. You know those brothers who overthrew their father after their youngest made them puke them all up by giving him wine and mustard? Well, they're back. And they're in charge of everything now. That's right, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Even though we introduced them already, they are all very complicated rulers of their individual dominions. So next week, we'll talk about the big three and go through some of the main myths and legends that revolve around them and their cosmic powers. Yay! If you like what you heard, please feel free to follow, subscribe, rate, and all the rest. And if you're looking for info or deeds, check out ohmygods.ca for the reading slash watching list, as well as the cheat sheet and the upcoming episodes. Thanks again for listening. Okay, bye. Bye.